Welcome back once again. And you may know the drill if you've watched these videos before, but uh, we're glad to have you. My name is Pastor David McKenzie. This is Bay Community Church Comox in virtual form, and uh, we're certainly glad that you're tuning in at this point in time, and, and uh, glad that you could be here as we continue along in the season of Pentecost. And we'll, uh, I guess, just take a moment here and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the grace that you've extended uh, to us to see it. We ask your blessing upon this time that we spend in uh, teaching. And we pray, O oh Lord, that the church, wherever she's gathered, wherever she's looking on from, uh, would be edified and built up in your name. And we pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit's presence in the midst of uh, your people, wherever they're gathered. And we pray that you might equip the, the church with your Holy Spirit's presence with everything that comes with that, the gifts, the gifts, the fruit, all the things that actually go with it, uh, the boldness to be able to preach in Christ's name. And we pray uh, that these things would be uh, with us and obvious to all those who actually look upon the church as a testimony, and we thank you for it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to actually invite Michael back in this case, and he's going to read uh, our readings for today. Thank you, Pastor David. Today we are staying entirely in the New Testament. Three readings, beginning with Acts 5, verses 1 to 13. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? And you, you have lied, you have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out and buried him. <clears throat> now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Second reading continues in Acts in chapter 13, verses 1 to 12. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, 
a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the prone council away from the faith. Then Paul, who is also called, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to aid him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And our last reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Blessed be God for the reading of his word. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Let's bow for a word of prayer again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your word made flesh. We thank you, O Lord, for your Holy Spirit's presence that is promised to the church through Christ's name. And we pray, O Lord, your mercy upon these particular words of interpretation, that they might be true, O Lord, to your intent, uh, to, to your biblical intent. And we pray, Lord, that the church will be built up and edified, even as it was in the time of Pentecost. We thank you, Lord, for all your good gifts to us, and we pray your mercy upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now I'm just going to grab some water here. Well, to get right into it, I'm just going to ask a question here. Have you ever noted that shocking contrast moment in Scripture when Jesus has asked the disciples who it is that you say that I am? I'm sure you have. And to his credit, Simon answers Jesus swiftly and answers him correctly when he says in Matthew 16, 15, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was, of course, a great testimony, and Jesus affirms what Peter had himself confessed with these words, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, or Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And in effect, this is simply Jesus saying, Simon, you didn't naturally figure this out. God the Father revealed it to you. It's not a natural conclusion, therefore. It's a supernatural conclusion in many respects. And you know it is true that divine revelation is a blessed thing. And you could argue that the whole essence of the scriptural record with the, the people of God being raised up is all one gigantic divine revelation in some way or shape or form. And yet the absolutely humbling thing, and you could say the absolutely frightening thing, is in the very next encounter that Jesus has with Peter. When Peter attempts to rebuke Jesus for stating that he was going to suffer and die, when that happens, Jesus equates Peter's desire with the person of Satan. Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. 
And you know, you, when you reflect on that, you think, uh, how is that even possible? You know, what kind of war must be going on every day that human beings like Simon Peter could receive a wondrous revelation from God and articulate that from the Father one day and be fully identified with Satan in the very next encounter? This is not only, I think, shocking on some level, but from the standpoint, I suppose, of human pride, it's incredibly depressing. But maybe God can work with that. You know, we, can, we ourselves can proclaim the wonder of divine revelation one minute and the cunning deceit of devils the next, I suppose. It's thoroughly within the, the realm of possibility. And I would say that in some respects, this just sheds light on our um, hopeless situation without God. You know, the species by itself is fundamentally without hope because it is fundamentally so, flaw so flawed and in some respects so under the influence of whatever. And it's yet another reason as uh, why, as we mentioned a few weeks back, that the gospel of Jesus Christ puts uh, zero trust in the flesh. None. We are, as the Apostle Paul indicates, vessels of clay, and somewhat naturally we are empty vessels at that. And this word empty brings me to the equally sobering and horrifying image that Jesus mentions in Matthew 12 when he describes in metaphorical terms what happens after an exorcism. You know, this, according to Jesus, is what happens. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. And you might want to ask yourself, why do such spiritually demonic squatters get to come back? Uh, but to be frank, I'm not sure that that's exactly the right question to ask. How about this? The real question that one might ask. It's this. Why is the house, in other words, the person, empty? If we are like houses, like dwellings, is it usual that a house or a dwelling should be empty? You know, Jesus even implies that his entire generation could be afflicted in this manner. Shockingly, the last state of an entire generation could be worse than the first for the same basic reasons. The answer to all this, though, if you think about it, is obvious. It is a good thing for an evil spirit to be shown the door and removed from the premises. It is, however, simply complete to have no other better spirit take up residence. Because good things happen when we're full up, you and I. And you know, if we, I think if we want to understand the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we must see it, I think, at least in part, from the standpoint of the word empty. There had been a great burst of enthusiasm in the early church. Believers were rejoicing in the move of God, and people were, were giving charity in enormous ways, and, and no one said that anything of theirs belonged to them, and it was uh, an, an amazing kind of uh, testimony to a unique time of unity. And Joseph, who was also called Barnabas, an amazing encourager of the early church, and a missionary companion to Paul and John Mark sold a section of land that belonged to him and brought the entire proceeds to the apostles for distribution. And likely everyone was rejoicing at just that kind of grace and marveling at it. And a couple named Ananias and Sapphira likely watched this happen. And they likely wanted to be as gracious as Barnabas, but they did not have his courage. 
And it seems that they made it look as though they had given all the proceeds of a recent land sale when they secretly held money back. Now understand this as part of the account that they could have just dedicated some of the proceeds and not all. That was within their mandate. The money was theirs to disperse or to keep. One might argue that they were obviously moved by what they saw in Barnabas and wanted to emulate it, but in reality they didn't feel that they could. They didn't have the courage to do it. And so they contrived a scheme that was a manipulative scheme and a deception. You might argue that they were, the couple was needy enough to want the recognition from the church, but scared enough to want to withhold money so as to deliberately deceive the church. Suffice it to say, you know, this is not a testimony of God's fullness. And Peter either discerned what was happening in the church spiritually or found out somehow. And so let's listen carefully to the phrasing of Peter's language when he, as an apostolic leader, confronts Ananias. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You know, it's fascinating to think that Simon Peter was himself challenged by Jesus using the same kind of provocative language. And I guess it's fair to say, hey, all of us can be deceived. Let's be frank about that. But in this case, Ananias and Sapphira were the deceivers. They contrived together to lie to the church and by extension to God himself. And both of, them as a, both of them as a consequence will drop like sacks of hammers when exposed. Are we crazy to want a house that is filled with such things where Satan fills our hearts? Are we not insane when we submit to this kind of filling? You know, the Gospel writer Luke makes the same kind of claim when describing what happened to Judas Iscariot, the same Judas who betrayed Jesus, if you recall. It's, he says this, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. You know, we might want to ask this. When Satan enters into somebody, could there be much room for anything else? The answer, though, to get back to an early point, like I say, is obvious. Even if our houses are empty, swept and in good order, to quote Jesus' words, it is simply incomplete to have no righteous occupant, no better spirit to take up residence. Because like I say, good things happen when we're full up. You know, the Apostle Paul said it succinctly in the form of a command, interestingly. He said, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled by the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 15 to 18. You know, it's not like good cheer, being filled with good cheer is going to suffice. That's, what not, that, that's not what needs to fill us. Someone, someone holy needs to fill us, not some thing. You know, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, Paul and Barnabas, after they were commissioned thus, came first to the island of, of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean. And you know, not far away there's a Roman proconsul named Sergius Paulus. But also in the proconsul's court there was a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. You know, it's curious that someone named Son of Jesus would be the primary resistance to the apostles' message to the 
eager and and willing Roman proconsul. It's also fascinating to me to note that I think it's probably true that demonic power tends to love power, even the power of politics. And it seems to gravitate to the courts of those in authority. That's an interesting thing to tuck away when you think about it. Anyway, this false prophet and magician wants to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And it is then that the apostle Paul confronts him. Once again, you'll note the language. Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, got that, he's full, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And you know, this wasn't just Paul talking. Paul was full of the Holy Spirit because Paul prophesied that Mr. Elimus or Bar-Jesus would become blind and be unable to see for a time. If it were merely Paul talking, then nothing would have happened. But as it was, it happened. And you know, here's another weird parallel. Jesus called Simon Peter Satan, and Peter later uses the same term when confronting Ananias. Paul, a Saul of Tarsus, or Paul as we know him, was once temporarily struck blind by Christ himself. And thus in the book of Acts, it almost seems to imply that as was the apostles' own experience with their Lord, so too was their spiritual authority in Christ. That's an interesting element to think and ponder about. Oddly, both Saul of Tarsus and Bar-Jesus, this character, needed to be led by the hand. You know, you can see Saul's version in Acts 9-8, and you can see the one we just read from Acts 13-11b, the last half of verse 11. You know, that's a very weird and strange parallelism to ponder, if you will. You know, a blind Saul of Tarsus was met by a disciple of Jesus named, interestingly, Ananias. And this is a good guy, Ananias, you could say. And this same disciple of Jesus prayed these words over Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, as you know. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and, wait for it, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, when you look at it and reflect upon that, can't you conclude exactly around this? It's not enough that a man who breathed threats against the church, who was ravaging the church, as it says in Acts, was moving house to house and was committing male and female followers of Jesus to prison and who wholeheartedly approved of the death of St. Stephen, it's not enough that he simply regain his sight, is it? It's not enough that he simply regains some calmer perspective, is it? It's not enough that he should actually come up, come around and and, and capture a little bit of humility in his life, is it? No way! Such a man, in order to be healed, in order to have his his house swept clean and put in good order, in order for in order that other unclean spirits might not rise up and then infect his life all over, absolutely needs the Holy Spirit's indwelling. And to the credit of Ananias, he prayed specifically for that. And it was so. Good things happen in the filling. Think about it. What made John the Baptist effective? He was full of the Holy Spirit even before birth, it says in Luke 1.15. What gave Elizabeth and Zechariah the power to prophesy about John and Jesus? She and he were both filled with the Holy Spirit, it says in Luke 1 as well. What turned the disciples from scared dwellers of the upper room to effective ministers of the gospel? They were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.4. What made Peter bold before the Sanhedrin to proclaim the gospel and to publicly hold the leaders accountable for the death of Jesus? He was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 4.8. 
What gave the disciples the capacity to work with God publicly? What gave them unprecedented unity? And what gave them the capacity for overwhelming charity? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, as it says in Acts 4.31. What made St. Stephen preach to the detriment of his own life before the council and the high priest? He was filled by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Acts 6.5. What made Barnabas so charitable and the encouraging companion of the Apostle Paul? He was filled with the Holy Spirit, as it says in in Acts 11.24. What made Paul, Barnabas, and other disciples able to withstand persecution in Antioch of Pisidia? They were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit, it says in Acts 13.52. Do you get my Pentecost point yet? This isn't what we call recreational dabbling in religion, folks. That kind of surface skim will not work. That type of, that type of seeker orientation where you don't push people further in the Lord is not going to suffice long term. It's not going to give you what you need to have in order to withstand the trial when, not if, when the trial comes. This is what you call looking to Jesus Christ as Savior first and asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit constantly. Constantly. You know, when the Bible says, be ye filled, if you want to quote the King James, this usually means continuous action. And you know, this action is the supernatural antidote to a house that should never be left spiritually empty. Even if and even when it is cleaned, swept, and put in good order, even that won't suffice. Ultimately, when you look at all buildings, they're meant to be filled This church is meant to be filled with the saints of God, but not just the saints of God. It's meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit as the people who uh, have the Holy Spirit gather as part of the body of Christ. It is meant to be a full house. Your house, your own body, is meant to be a vessel, but not an empty vessel a vessel of the love of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is these things which empower the church. And when the church doesn't seem particularly empowered, it's probably these things that need to be addressed. And so it is that I would urge you to not just rush to an acceptance of Christ as a concept, but to invite Christ's Holy Spirit within you to believe and to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Because like I say, I don't mind and I don't care whether your house is a complete and total wreck or whether it's clean, swept, and in good order. Without the dweller, the right dweller, the blessed and holy dweller, trouble's going to come because in the end, that house is just hollow. Let us give thanks to God who actually has promised the Holy Spirit and who even says, you know, that, that God will not withhold what people ask for. In terms of the good gifts of God, and there is no greater gift than the presence of the Holy Spirit in one's life, I would urge you to take this Pentecostal truth, this truth of Pentecost, and apply it to your situation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the gospel message of forgiveness in Christ Jesus. But Lord, we don't want to end there. We want to say hallelujah for that, but we also want to say, Holy Spirit, indwell, please. Indwell in the midst of your people. Indwell inside the people. 
Be there, O Lord, as the, the, the true owner of the house and fill it from one room to the next so that there might be, Lord, no squatters of the demonic kind and no hollowness that will simply flit the person like a leaf from one wind to the next. Father, we need your Holy Spirit wind to indwell within us, to be part of us. We thank you for the message of Pentecost. We ask your blessing upon the church wherever she is, that this might be her reality and that she might be emboldened and empowered in you, by you, and through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.